Welcome to another episode, and my guest today is Neil Smiles, former gunner, now working in the defence industry. Neil often posts his thoughts on military matters on LinkedIn, and it was on the future of the Royal Artillery that got my attention. In it, he stated that when you aren't equipped or established to fight in the traditional combined arms manner, you have to change. In this episode, Neil will set out the changes he feels the Army, and specifically Royal Artillery, should make, and we discuss the current state of the Army, how it should train in the use of simulation, the future soldier concept and the shift from close to deep battle, moving close support artillery to the infantry to be owned by the infantry and how that would look, the gunners to be a missile-only deep effects organisation, the use of UAS on the battle space and the challenges of recruitment. Kev and I tackled something similar in Podcast 45 where we discussed Ukraine, specifically the use of precision long-range fires, the fact that the biggest killer in the battle space still remains conventional artillery and that mass matters. We talked about the importance of the role of observed fire by soldiers on the ground and the over-reliance in some instances of technical platforms such as unmanned air systems. However, we need to remember that three things matter in defence and these are reach, the ability to have a decisive impact on an enemy and cutting-edge technology. The UK in its current state can't manage all three. Finally, it would be great if you could rate the podcast on Spotify or iTunes or wherever you get your podcast from as this helps me know how we're doing and if the content is hitting the mark. If you do like the pod and would like to support it, then you can check out the Buy Me A Coffee link in the show notes, and there you also find other links to the blog site, for example. So I'll shut up now and let Neil get on. So Mike, great to see you. Can you start beginning with an overview of your military career? Hi Colin, thanks for having me on. Um... Well, yeah, well, um, it all started when I blew my maths all level and uh, my plans all went out the window, even at 16, and I ended up at Junior Leaders Regiment in Bramker way back in 1983. Something popped up the other day. That was 40 years ago this July, so I'm not a, I'm not a young whippersnapper anymore. I started in 9-4 locating regiment cellar, uh, and I went straight on exercise Lionheart as soon as I got to the unit. Uh, I was only there six months, though, and uh, I moved to Dortmund with the newly reformed 3-2 Heavy. And that's where I first met folks from your old lot in the Special OP Troop. Anyway, when I uh, when I got to uh, 3-2 Heavy, um, there was a full-on uh, reorganisation of the gunners in swing, and um, they got rid of their swing fire back to the Armoured Corps. They dropped all of their independent batteries they reconfigured so that there was three gun regiments per brigade and there was a system specifically to counter BM-21, which I suppose, given what's going on in Ukraine today, was pretty prescient. That system's MLRS and that set the tone for my career. I had my first taste of MLRS in 1986 uh, and a few of us got sent down to the south to go to a US unit and the US had started deploying um, M110, the big 8-inch guns, and MLRS together in the same units. But as you'll remember, it, um, MLRS never arrived in the British Army until Op Granby. Uh, and in 3-2 Heavy, we were even later. I think it was 91, 92 when we got ours. All the way up to W02, I sort of dabbled in MLRS comms and CPs for most of my time. And that included two tours with the Bates team. Don't know if people remember that, the uh, battlefield artillery target engagement system that we had. With MLRS, it was actually pretty good. So I know that the guns people complained about it a lot, and it was complicated, but from an MLRS point of view, you could send something from an observer all the way into the fire control system of the launcher. And that's something that they still can't do today. You know, now they've gone to this uh, digital comms claims and networked enabled capability. But but we could do it, and it was very good. Sorry to interrupt, mate. Was that also what it was meant to be about having dispersed gun possessions and allowing them all to come into a central nodal point, if you like, so that they could fire but still remain yeah, dispersed and concentration of fire and 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 um, rap- speeding up your processes, automatically uh, processing fire missions all the way from division down to um, down to platforms. And while it never went all the way into a gun fire control system with with MLRS, it did. It went all the way in, 
and the DC got a little message pop up on his screen saying call for fire received from battery. Um, I did the normal, us- the usual sort of tours of Northern Ireland. I did Op Granby. I did a stint in the old city centre in Nicosia with the UN. And then I got to the job I'd always wanted, which was SMIS, or Sergeant Major Signals, only for it all to be yanked away, and I was made to uh, stand a gap as a battery sergeant major at short notice. I ended up doing three and a half years as BSM, battery sergeant major, which is more than lucky. For, for, oh, it's more than enough for anybody. <laughs> But it was in two batteries, so I sort of stood in for a year, and then I'd got um, my second proper tour all of my own, um, and it was a radical change of direction. So I got sent to 2-2 battery, which was a Phoenix battery, uh, and we did things like um, Safe Seria in Oman, a good three-month deployment there, which was over uh, 9-11. And that turned out to be a bit of a rehearsal of sorts for Telic 1. So I went to um, Iraq second time round, with a Phoenix battery. Phoenix had some, um, it had some issues, and uh, I think its uh, its journey into service was not smooth. I think it's well documented. But for all of those problems, it had a pretty good war on Telic 1, uh, and so did the soldiers using it. I mean, we were genuine authorised observers, which meant we could call for fire from gun batteries. Some of my guys were calling in JDAM strikes on, on precision targets in, in the middle of Basra. We were talking tanks onto objectives. It was a great little system. Sometimes it crashed. But generally speaking, the product that you got from it was very, very good. And what I think it did do is it, it showed the power of tactical UA, UAVs, and that's 20 years before um, the current Ukraine war, where, where obviously UAVs are playing a big part. But this was 20 years ago, tactically employing them and at the cutting edge of, of artillery. And then after Telic 1, I got a bit of a lucky break, I think. Picked up my uh, RSMs tour, and uh, so I didn't end up getting rotated through endless Iraq tours like everybody else. I, instead, I got sent off to the hotbed of South Wales with a territorial regiment. And I went kicking and screaming, how dare they send me off to the TA? Of course, <laughs> I should have been RSM first RHA because I was the best guy on the list. But actually... It was a brilliant tour. I really enjoyed it. Contrary to what I thought, they were very, very professional. When I got there, they already had a whole subunit deployed on one of the very early Shiba Force Protection jobs, so a whole company. Um, but for me, it was a different experience. I, I didn't didn't do the, the Shiba job. Uh, I did civic engagement type tasks, you know, things with the mayor's office in uh, Newport and Cardiff. But then I would also do things like uh, I'd be on a Friday afternoon, I'd be in coveralls with a CO's driver weed in the front of RHQ ready for the DRA's visit. And then I came to the t- end of my uh, RSM's tour, and um, I know some people have an internal sort of debate whether they're going to go for commissioning or not. I didn't really have that debate. I um, I felt I could offer something still, so I just applied. But of course, things are different now. At that time, 99% of the applicants were W01s. It was almost a given unless you'd really dropped a clanger. And uh, I certainly didn't have the hoops of interviews and essays and things like that to write. Um, so one day I finished being the really important guy that was the RSM. And the next day I was just a captain back in an MRS regiment doing RTO. It is a bit of a fall from grace, actually, RSM back down to, to LE. But, um, yeah, no, it's part of the job. What I didn't expect, though, having sailed into the officer's mess thinking, right, I'll show all these young subbies what the score is. I didn't expect three years of knees to the chest. It was a really, really hard three years. But the other thing that was happening was guided MLRS unitary was coming into service. So this is um, this is the, the generation of MLRS that people see in Ukraine now, as opposed to the old rockets that disperse bomblet everywhere. We rushed it into service. The Americans rushed it into service as well. And uh, we were going to send it to Afghanistan. And I think it was a bit of a success there. But the training became different and the focus was different. And the long and short of it is that you could no longer have a monkey in the cab who just fired all 12 rockets at a six-figure coordinate. Now you were doing multiple effects, multiple fuse settings, different trajectories, firing on different targets all at the same time. Um, So we had to change the training quite a bit. Targeting became more critical. Um, It was a counterinsurgency sort of... uh, operation so that there were checks and balances that hadn't applied in the past with MLRS but it was employed as a very close support system and I think in part while it was successful in Afghanistan these changes laid the sort of ground for some of the problems that that the systems had recently 
one of the massive changes was airspace clearance became a thing. If I tell you, with that, I'm not going to break any secrets. This thing goes up to 75,000 feet. So that's twice the height of your flight to Tenerife on holiday. And so airspace clearance for MLS wasn't just helicopters and aircraft at low level that you were expecting to see, but it was civvy aircraft transiting across Afghan airspace out of sight almost. And and this is something that they still haven't shaken off. I think it's fair to say that um, airspace clearance um, is a hindrance that they can't get their heads around. The RAF gets a primacy and the, the army has to sort of adapt to it. But MLS did come back into vogue. I think that's a thing people don't realise as well, because even in a, an artillery, a dumb artillery round will go, you know, 5,000 metres up in the air, I believe it. If it's firing mm-hmm. at 20 k's, it's normally... But I think I remember off the top of my head, something like a third off of that is the height it normally goes at. Is that yeah. correct? Yeah, it's... um. So this is a consideration if you've got airspace which you completely control and your aircraft move, move around with, with complete freedom, then it does become a anything. Mortars, light guns, 155... MLRS, it all becomes a problem. My second tour kept me in lane. So generally speaking, what the army does with LEs is late entry officers, is it um, it gives you a sort of like a a slow start in something that you understand normally within an artillery battery, and then it moves you off into other kinds of jobs and roles which you're not necessarily expecting. But I got left in the MLRS world, and so I left the unit in uh, in Northumberland, and I came back down to Lark Hill. And I did my final tour as the technical instructor in gunnery, the TIG, for MLRS at the School of Artillery. And this is where my past life in the Army and my present life, what I do now, sort of started to blur the edges and and, and, uh, overlap. So I got to Lark Hill, and to my amazement, they were still training MLRS detachments formally, using all of the old training objectives for dumb rockets with bomblets. Uh, and they did that because, to quote them, you know, the new stuff hasn't been endorsed. Well, that's fine, but that's wrong. So I started changing everything over to the guided stuff. And I also got involved with a, a little system which was tip-top secret to start with, um, called Exacta. It sort of came under my on my desk as well because it was a guided system that the artillery were firing. And that system did use quite a lot of simulation so true to form, when the training needs analysis was done for guided MLRS, um, the answer was just use a laptop. But then I had this system exactor where we had some fairly swept up simulators because we couldn't fire it live in training. It, it, um, the first the first real time that they'd fire it would be in anger. So we were working with an unusually good program manager from DENS, from Abbey Wood, the procurement executive. And we were using an Israeli training concept for the Exactor system uh, in a wholly different way to anything that we'd used before. So myself and my three sergeant majors sort of took some of these principles, had a good long hard look at the MLS stuff and where we didn't really know what was going on in, inside the cab and we built our own cab simulator for MLS. And it was transformational. Don't want to sort of like blow my own trumpet particularly, but it just made training so much better. So we actually stopped using um, real launchers on the plane for a whole week, and we would thrash the detachment commanders we were training inside the cab simulator so that we knew that they had everything nailed down inside the cab. And then the week after, we would go out on the plane, and you didn't need to worry about what they could do because you knew that they, they could do their job. And then afterwards, it was all about tactically moving the launch around around the woods and things um and 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 it was simulation that enabled this and then it all ended i had a run-in with a senior officer and he was more senior than me anyway a couple of ranks above me he said his piece i said my piece he said he didn't like what i'd done i exploded i blew my fuse i threw my teddies out of the pram i burnt the pram i stamped all over my toys i spat my dummy out I went home, I fumed, I didn't sleep, I went into the office at 7 o'clock the next morning and I signed off. And I think my attitude was, if you know better than me, then sir, you can train it. Um, Because I did know my stuff, this guy had called it into question and I, so I left. And that was in 2012 after 29 regular years. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because when I left the military, I got a job in the aerospace sector. 
uh, working with UAS. So I was involved as a civilian a lot at meetings with the army, going out to Afghanistan and Iraq to work with them out there. And I do believe, I don't know if it's a gunner thing, but remarkably stuck in the ways at times and uh, reluctant to take advice, especially officers, civilians. And yeah, so I do recognise that attitude. And I don't know if it's changed. Uh, we can talk about that a bit later on, mate. You already hinted at it, but quick overview then, mate, on your line of work since leaving the army. To cut a long story short, but you obviously don't want that, simulation. Um, not long before my very vocal resignation, I'd started to figure out that the army only played at it. So the exacta thing was a good case in point. You know, we um, we we got a training system in to do exacta, and it wasn't an army solution. It was the it was the provider's solution, and it was very good. And the thing about simulation is, with a little bit of ele- of, of effort, it can make training really good. Um, I'm not saying it's the be all and end all, and yeah, you still have to get your your knees muddy and um, go out in the rain, but. If simulation is done well, it becomes a capability multiplier. You can repeat things over and over again. You can do things till you get it right. It isn't going to cost anything. It's no ammunition being wasted. There's no safety restrictions. And I kind of figured out, okay, the army's not, the artillery certainly are not really doing this properly. I can probably make a living at this. And uh, not too long before I did resign... I took a bit of a gamble on doing something slightly off the wall for a visit of a foreign delegation at the School of Artillery. And the net result of that was that some people in the headquarters wanted my head on a spike the next day, but my boss didn't. My boss called me in the next day. I thought I was going for a, for my head to be put on a spike. And he said, I'm leaving the army. Do you want to come with me? So we did. We set up our own little company and uh, and worked towards leaving. Now the the blowout that I described earlier was was happening anyway, and that was the catalyst for 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 doing it. But yeah, we um, I don't know. He recognised something that I'd done that has been a bit innovative, and um, and we left together and set our own little company up. I also did go back in the reserves though as well. So in 2014, some lunatic destroyed the UK's MLS capability. They disbanded the only regular regiment put it into little penny packets and split it up with gun regiments. I think um, this was a result of the Afghanistan close support experience where some people thought that actually it's just a close support system, we'll stick it with guns, but um, it didn't really work. I got asked if I could um, go into the reserves as a reserve IG just to sort of keep a weather eye on some of the things that were happening. But it turned out this was just an attempt at camouflaging some of the problems, I think, and I was basically not getting any gigs with MLRS. And then out of the blue, I got offered, or I got asked if I would take up the post of a BC in the TA regiment in Newcastle, 101 regiment. But one of the things I think I really enjoyed about um, my little stint with the reserves was blatantly using company resources for my own training. Now, I hope there's no Americans in Cubic listening to this. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I, do, I hope your podcast spreads far and wide, but um, just for this one, I hope they missed it. That's, that's more like it. That's more like it. <laughs> the reserves don't get anything. In some ways, it's really embarrassing about how they're trapped by the regular, regular army. There's, there's reasons for that. But um, one of the things they absolutely don't get is any funding for simulation. Nobody looks that low down. The reserves get nothing. And one of the things we used to do at 101, I'm sure it still goes on. Well, in fact, I know it's just about to end, to come to an end, as every so often a battery would get um, told that they were the lead to do a, a reduced range practice rocket firing at Otterburn ranges. I viewed this as a complete waste of time. You could do another podcast on why our RPR is bad. And I brought the battery down to the, to the plane for a weekend. So I jacked up flights, low loaders, launchers, but then I also had at work all of the cubic gear, the um, trackers, synthetic UAV feed for target areas, some some systems to um, sort of double up the comms and give them a bit of a wrap. And uh, and I used that, and we did a weekend's tactical manoeuvre, and it was brilliant. It really was brilliant. 
Then the ca- the calendar goes round, and a few months later, or about about six months later, it's my battery's turn again to do a live firing weekend, and I again uh, declined to do it. And I took them to Speed Adam instead of Otterburn and uh, ran a similarly augmented targeting exercise. I don't know if you've been up there, but there's loads of old East German kit dotted around it. And and again, I took trackers, took some of the some of some of the stuff from work, give them feeds of target areas, and uh, and we had a really good weekend. And actually, the second weekend was much better attended than the first weekend. And the good thing about simulation, especially when you're doing it with um, people who don't get the hands-on stuff very often, is a lot of people think that live firing is the is the pinnacle of artillery training, and it's not. You have to do it. There are reasons why you have to do it. But it's silted up with safety procedures. It's restricted by volumes of ammunition. And when you do stuff with simulation, you can do it at real rates, real tempo, real difficulties. The range boundary is not a, a restriction anymore. So yeah, in, in a lot of respects, doing artillery training with simulation is better than, than live firing. doesn't replace it, but it's it's got its place. I mean, just a quick question there, Neil. So one of the areas you can't replicate is the volume of fire that would go down in real time. I mean, as you've already pointed out, you can't do that on a range because I've been at the OP end and you'll get like one round fire for effect. But, yeah. you know, you look down the Falklands, those guys, you read the after action report in the Falklands, guys were knackered from unpacking ammunition, mm-hmm. firing the ammunition. Mm-hmm. And it's a really physically tiring job. So though you can simulate a lot of the technical stuff, you can't simulate that physical hardship of doing sustained firing. But I don't think there's any way you can, because you don't have the money for the rounds, there's no way you can replicate that anyway, is there? Maybe we should do another podcast on something we've got at work. Um, <laughs> but okay, uh, I'll take you off one. No, you, you're right. Um, I think, Neil's opinion, all the ammunition tends to be geared around the, the front end. So it's about an OP seeing, seeing what a real round looks like in Otterburn on a bare hill. Personally, I think if you've got 200 rounds, it's better off being focused on the gun end. If all 200 rounds arrive on the gun position and it's unboxed like maniacs and they get rid of it all in the first few minutes, that has achieved some realism in training which doesn't exist. But instead, as you just described, one round fire for effect, or it's a five minute serial on a fire plan and there's one round at the start, one in the middle, one at the end. Um, but you're right. I mean, I remember on Granby, and we had eight inch guns on Granby, you know, our gun bunnies were broken. We just don't get anywhere near that in training. I did an exchange trip to the States and we were doing uh, gunnery. I was on the OPs and uh, came down to fire effect. And as my usual way at the time, I turned around to the American version of an instructor gunnery and said, how many rounds can I have at fire for effect? And he went, how many do you think you need for this mission? <laughs> and I said, yeah, whatever it was, eight rounds fire for effect. And he went, oh, you've got them. Just ask for them. And that was the difference between the Americans who had the money and us, it's sad, but um, it's a reality. It's no good complaining about some of these things. Um, I suppose why I'm making a living at what I do. There are ways to get around some of these things. The turret trainer for AS90 is phenomenal. I did a study a couple of years ago. It was some paid work as a consultant to do a study into um, simulation for the gunnery staff course. And I think it was on contract for 800 hours a year and they were using 300 hours. When my tour ended, um, I stayed briefly in part-time uniform as a sort of MLRS advisor to RSA. At work, I sort of head up a little innovation hub, and I work with four or five really, really capable guys. And they're all self-taught, all bar one, former servicemen. Some of the simulation solutions that we have are phenomenally good. Uh, You might have heard of Blue Shell. I've posted the odd thing about that. That's our light gun simulator. Um, that's brilliant. That that's we're really well received. Every time we roll that out, it it um it gets good press. We've got a one hundred and twenty. What does that do, Neil? So what it does? So back mate. to your back to your loading problems. You can thrash thrash bunnies on it, and it tells you everything and, that it does. And sorry, sorry, just before Neil, hold on. We've got some non gunners here. Gun bunnies is a pejorative term for <laughs> the gun crews. <laughs> yeah, yeah. ram the shells up the gun barrels <laughs> yes yes when we did our uh, 
So we've got uh, this. We don't have a gun simulator. We have a set of kit which clips on a live gun. So, you know, in, in salesman's term, you own the simulator already. Would you like to bring it to life? So one of the elements of this is simulated ammunition. Now, it's only one-tenth the weight of a real shell. And there's good reasons for that that will take us all day to explain. But when we did our first day's acceptance testing, we had one gun with one detachment, and the guy who has to ram the shell, now you do this left-handed when you're ramming a light gun, he did that many rounds in a day, he did not turn up the next day. So even though there were one-tenth the weight, it absolutely broke him. Um, so you can sort of, yeah, it's one-tenth the weight, so it's not the real weight, but when you do it a hundred times a day, we've got a 120 millimeter mortar training solution that is genius. And I mean genius. I can't describe it on the on a podcast. It just won't do it justice, but it's genius. I had a curry with a guy I served with a few weeks ago. Uh, I was his BSM. He was a full screw at the time. And he's now an early major coming to the end of a 30-year career in the army. And he described an army that was in very poor shape, bad morale, recruitment issues, and no equipment to train on amongst its many challenges. Uh, as a civilian working with the army... But as a soldier previously, what's your take on what you're seeing? Well, I think he's generally generally correct with his overall sort of synopsis, but I'll have to answer this carefully because nobody likes the baby to be called ugly and the parents are still paying me. <laughs> <laughs> I, th- I think um, generally, though, he's, he's not far off the mark. I personally, Neil... Neil's personal view is I think retention is a bigger danger than recruitment I mean you know if somebody goes the job still needs doing somebody now has two jobs that person's morale starts to drop he signs off he leaves somebody else is getting two extra jobs and so it it goes on and on and I think that the problem is it's getting compounded by recruitment Um, you know recruitment is low it's not they're not hitting their targets and they're losing people I think that's a big problem. I don't see enough day-to-day army life to know exactly what's going on, but I think if you, you know, when you look at a magic eye picture and you sort of look, try to look through it, not stare directly at it, you can see the drift and the drift is negative. We had occasion not long ago where um, our army customer cancelled something and the, the reason they gave was because the training audience were too busy. I'm like, what? Have I missed something? Have we gone to war? From me observing a small section of the army population on a reasonably regular basis, I'd say the opposite is true. I don't think they are too busy. I think they're busy on the wrong things. And on the shop floor, they're not kept occupied with meaningful activity. And the junior management, I think junior management, I would would classify as like sergeants to captains. They're mod net zombies. You know, they're, they're focused on the pc that's on the desk and tasks just come in and overwhelm them and because that happens their attention isn't focused on their on their their junior soldiers and and so the junior soldiers don't do meaningful activity casting back to our day there was an element of sweeping down the gun park yeah uh that lack of meaningful activity so i think that's always existed but do you think that's showing a great a greater presence in this day and age I do. Um, yeah, you're right. We would, you know, Friday afternoon in, in, in autumn in Dortmund, you'd be sweeping leaves up till you were drowning in them. But what you had done on Thursday was gun drill all day. And so mm. I think the difference is they're still doing the sweeping up, but they're not doing the gun drill. Yeah. I, it's, it's a complex, it's a complex sort of subject. I'll get, I think I can, I'm going to get to it in a roundabout way. When you and I were lads, we trained for war. That was our job. But now work is invented that takes on a life of its own. And when they start making, you know, when, when other tasks fill the, the, the time of the people in the middle junior management slots, the sergeant to captain cohort, it absorbs them. And then they have to do these tasks. But it's not training for war. And that's what their job is. Majors, I think majors drown in um, report writing. And... From what I can tell, everybody is a slave to some sort of spreadsheet. Everybody, you know, when you've got a computer on your desk, it influences what you do. 
I met my old Granby adjutant last week at DSEI in London at XL, big defence um, exhibition. And on a gunner net, the adjutant was the all-seeing master of net discipline because he trained with us on a CPX every couple of weeks. You know, the, the adjutant owned the regimental net. He was good at what he did. I haven't seen a full fire direction centre, the regimental headquarters that the adjutant works in, on an exercise in years. And as a, as a former signal sergeant major, I regularly bite my lip. I do bite my lip. I don't say much. I've got past that. But they don't do it enough. And an unintended consequence of Afghanistan, I think, certainly in the artillery, has been to make the battery the normal level of effort, not the regiment. So the people that would have a battlefield role at regimental level are just enabling batteries to go on things. They're not doing stuff themselves. Looking back to the 1980s, and I know it was a bit more ordered back then, but you know, you come off Christmas leave and you pretty much could see the calendar written out and it start with the New Year troop exercises, leading up to battery exercises, leading up to regimental exercises, leading up to regimental firing camp, brigade exercise maybe, and then uh, courses in between. Mm -hmm. So you were, that training regime was very busy. And I listened to a podcast recently where it said that um, there has been no core level large scale exercise since 2002 probably couldn't even fill a core these days to be fair mm. they said that 80s training was amongst the most demanding in the post-war period and preparation for war at scale was taken very seriously and every two to four years one BR corps as it was known then and its allies deployed to the field on exercises like Lionheart and Reforger armoured warfare is fast moving and requires real estate to be realistic I just don't think we have that I don't know. What, I just go back to it. So it's just a puzzle. What, we can't afford it. We haven't got the kit. We haven't got the real estate. Bit of all three of those, but I think they could change things. They could do things. You, you've said your colleague mentioned training on equipment. I mean, that is an issue. But as another Afghanism is mission specific training. So I think you can almost you can see when it when this when this changed. We were in Iraq, then going to Afghanistan, and the pre deployment training. That also got a tempo of its own. And I think it's fostered a culture that training is provided by a separate organisation. So you're a unit, you go to, you come on to, um, I think they call them Pashtun Savers, Pashtun Dawn was the exercise on the plane. The the battalion or the battle group would go to Lugashall, there'd be a, um, 40 or 50 vehicles, you know, those big uh, um, troop carriers on on the square at Lugashall, they would have all their kit for um, their Afghan mission training laid next to it. They would sign for it all, and then they would trundle off and they would do the fob exercise, then the roadside bomb exercise, and then at the end of it, they would come out the other end. Right, you take trained, ready to go. But units used to train themselves. I've seen that the you know they use a system now called Churchill. Every and every event has to have an administrative wrap around it. You must... Is it on Churchill? No. Well, you can't have your tanks, you can't have your fuel, you can't have your ammunition. I used to go out the back with my troop at Lark Hill. You know, we... Okay, what are we doing today? Nothing. Right, you lazy so-and-sos. Get in your trucks, we're going out. And so whole fleet management has damaged things. The fact that everything's got to be created on Churchill means that administration has to be in place. But I think they expect it to be a, a formalised event, not something that you do when you're not doing something and i think speaking as a gunner the perpetual chasing of efficiencies in other words cutting stuff out means that the school of artillery doesn't train regimental instructors it gets somebody through the training objectives in three weeks okay you're trained now back to your unit those courses used to be like eight weeks long and as well as the formal training bit there was the training you to be an instructor and you would do several, you know, dry run-throughs of very, very strict lessons. Um, that doesn't happen. The IG's course, Instructor in Gunnery's course for regular officers, is 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 bo it's a bottom third sport. So when they carve up the reporting year and there's the top third superstars, the middle thirds, it'll, it'll keep the regiment ticking along. And then you've got your guys who unfortunately come in the bottom third. You know, that's the IG course. And then when we were younger, regimental two ICs used to always be IGs, instructors in gunnery. And so there was somebody in the unit who knew how to put together collective training for, for the artillery. And, and this doesn't happen anymore. Inclination to just train has dried up. 
And if you don't spend time and effort to train in a training culture, then repetitive training just won't happen. But your your friend's right about the um, the kit. I think that's a, that's a crime, not having kit. They get kit. The kit isn't working properly, doesn't work properly. They don't know how to fix it. Time's wasted. It becomes a, a self-fulfilling prophecy. My industry has to shoulder a degree of guilt for um, for some of the simulation problems, but the procurement agency does as well. Simulation has, has become not cheap when it really should be. You know, that's the point. Uh, and it does save extraordinary amounts of money. I mean, I, we would always say that it's not to save money, it's to make training better, but it does save money. And these things are cheap, but how have they become not cheap? It's crazy. And unfortunately, innovation and affordability gets strangled by the generation of requirements and the tender process. And it's crackers because frontline command should be able to just buy or contract what they think look good looks like, because that's what we do in industry. It's what you do at home. You don't put a requirement yeah. document out for your new car. You go and you go and test drive a few and say, okay, I'll have that one. And then I think the um, there's a, a rank versus rights conundrum. I know that they're desperate to get people in. I don't know what exactly is going wrong. And I think people who join the army should be prepared to expect a degree of restriction on freedoms. And I think that if the system was honest with what it's going to be like, then people would join and expect to be living in a disciplined way. I think in some ways I see more discipline on reserve drill nights than I do see with some of the um, interactions we have with training it does, the army doesn't exist for, for somebody to be all they can be and grow as a person. And I think when you approach the army as an experience to be lived and you look at it like a job, it becomes just a job. I think the, yeah. the, the last sort of thing I'll say on this on this topic, and I think you, your friend is right, and to sort of to validate his assessment, um, we have recently, we've got a simulation system and I have seen the soldiers of two friendly nations our reserves and our regulars on it and the regulars came forth okay i think uh a bit of a donut to, f- to finish up on <laughs> and that part was the, the question mate <laughs> so the first point you made in your linkedin post was that and i quote the army is too small a maneuver component attrition would unbalance it and render it combat ineffective one set piece brigade attack met with stiff resistance and it's done what's your solution to this well, there's a document came out in December 21 um, called Future Soldier, and it was about the reorganisation and the rebalancing that they're, they're in the process of doing now. And it's got the only viable answer, and that is to shift from close to deep battle. I'm not saying it's right, but it's the only viable option. And there's a line in it about brigade combat teams um, being self-sufficient and integrating the full range of capabilities at the lowest possible level. And that's fine. But this paper also sets out, and this has happened now, that in 3DIV, all of the guns and rockets are in a separate brigade combat team. Yet in 1DIV, the guns are the property of manoeuvre brigade combat teams. So the statement and the reality are incompatible. If you're going to integrate everything, then the brigade combat teams should have some of it. And if you're going to go to deep, then they don't necessarily get any of it. And I think it's the only viable option now. We're, we're too small to try and do everything we used to be able to do. I accept it's more nuanced than that. And in one div, the guns are mainly reserves, but not all of them. But the net effect is that integration is going to happen on the line of departure in some far off country. Because the small amount of gunner capability is passed around rotating battle groups in collective training. You've got 30 regular battalions only three under-resourced regular gun regiments. The flywheel of the battalions is moving slower than the flywheel of the of the gun regiments. When you compare it to the Cold War I'll back that we'll remember, there are now either too many manoeuvre units or too few guns. It, it, it's you know it's black and white. There's um there's there's no debate to be had about that. And and I, you know the question I sort of look at is. We've got 30 regular battalions, three under-resourced gun regiments. Should we reduce the 81mm mortars to three platoons and cycle them around all the battle groups? Well, the answer is, of course not. So why do we do it with the guns? 
if you want to fight like we used to, it needs a rebalance. And to shift from close to deep, the equipment plan obviously has to be correct. And this is going to take money. You know, there's no way around that. It takes money. But the first thing that really has to happen, given that document, is a root and branch change to army training doctrine. Because in my opinion, in simple terms, future soldier is either being ignored or they're defaulting to the lowest, simplest common denominator. Let's just train infantry and armour to manoeuvre. I mean, that document's been out nearly two years, but just about all the funding, all the resources, and all the effort in collective training is still focused on the battle group. It's it's just not right. As you can imagine, I could go on and on, but um, if there's going to be five big UK collective training exercises a year on Salisbury Plain, they can't all be about sticking bayonets in each other in Imber Village. What they should have on them are GBAD fire groups, an ability for engineers to find crossing points, fully resourced mini-mash Kazivak ex- uh, elements to them. Most of all, if we're going to do deep strike, they need a target matrix that's got to be found, classified, prioritised and engaged to destruction that isn't just the Op 4 HQ or a rifle platoon dug in at Imber. Big ticket items of Ukraine counteroffensive, breaching minefields and deep strike. Now, of course, there's all sorts of other things going on there. But the thing that slowed them down, which hopefully they're going to get through rapidly now, are minefields. Massive minefields. Not a couple of mines laid on a track to slow you down. Massive minefields. When does our engineer group do a collective training exercise where they've got to get through a minefield the width of Salisbury Plain? Yeah, I was just about to say that. You're talking kilometres deep. Yes, um, and again, this this is Cold War stuff that we had an engineer on. We're talking about this uh, recently. Uh, exactly that again in Cold War days. This was trained. Mm-hmm. Absolutely is. Or was when you're tiny, you, you have to get your combat element ready. I appreciate that, but it's got to be at low level. If you get the low level stuff, you know, platoon and company stuff, then right, then you you're on the right track. But you really need to get your 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 stuff together for the combat support and the combat service support. I mean, the Russians are finding this out now. Their C2 and their logistics are getting hammered. Their artillery is getting by hammered. By deep strike. By deep strike. And one little bit to sort of pick on is mechanical handling equipment. It's a great example. It's the difference between our resupply of ammo and the Russians. So, you know, we have forklifts, forks, container handlers, stuff like that. When they resupply gun units, they they uh, back a truck up to a to a pile of shells, and people load them onto the truck. You know that that's something that should completely put our tempo at a different rate than theirs. But we don't exercise our mechanical handling. You know, you might at seventeen Port and Maritime move some containers down the road, but we we stick the. I don't know. The youngest gunner gets the forklift course in the MT and it's an afterthought and it's done because we have to move pallet, a few pallets of ammo for live firing. It's not about having a, a 500 by 500 ammunition dump with everything camouflaged and moved around on a track plan that's, that's done quickly and quietly and at night. That's collective training for the things that matter. And also these, uh, if you look at a gun regiment that goes to war, and I'm not saying we'll replicate what happened in Granby and the like, but a gun regiment in wartime, with all the logistic support that's going to have, and uh, if it's an eight-gun battery, not a six-gun battery, is in peacetime, you're talking well over a thousand people. It's mm-hmm. a huge, huge yeah. regiment in wartime. Absolutely. And I think when we were younger, you would do these things occasionally, and you would you would take people out of guns to enable the logistics just for a phase on the exercise. But it meant that the QM understood things, the QM tech understood things. The FDC understood that ammunition took time to move around. Um, it, I, I don't see it. I don't see it anymore. As you'll appreciate, a large part of what I do is is supporting the current training reality. But I think that if the army, not the procurement agency, engage with training providers about radical change, then training could be changed, could be adapted. And the approach to getting into contact would change because it would be done at reach. You can't train the captains of today using the retired Wiley Valley general staff. 
and I have seen that on recent exercises. You know, thrusting young captains, just really getting to grips with um, with what they do in a battalion or a regiment. And we've got the the retired cohort that live in the Wiltshire countryside talking about stuff that's 30, 40, 50 years out of date. I'm not suggesting the M4 rifles shouldn't train to assault positions, but it shouldn't be the focus. Maybe they shouldn't get guns at all. What would you talk about? Maybe giving 120 mortars integral yeah. to a battalion? I think that's one of the solutions. Um, that's yeah, been that's the thrust. over the years, hasn't it? It has. It's the thrust of my sort of um, my argument on that LinkedIn post is that the artillery is too small. You've got to do one thing well, mm. not dozens of things badly. Let the brigade combat teams deal with all of the close stuff. So would you say get rid of 81 and get 120 in? No, no, I think oh, 81 and 120 are complementary systems that should overlap in in the in the battle group. It's not an artillery sport anymore. The second point you made was there are nowhere near enough close support assets to prepare objectives and win the artillery duel. Unmask a very diluted gun regiment to support the brigade attack without first neutralising the enemy offensive support and the brigade gets no support. Again, what's your solution to this? I think we have to accept reality. Money as a vote, manpower levels are finite. I think after looking at the training doctrine, the second thing that needs to happen is a rebalance of what is in the, the field army. There is no scenario on the planet now in which the RA, the Royal Artillery, can carry on as before. The only thing we could do is Captain Blackadder's Umboto Gorge. We we just can't do it. <laughs> I think it really is time to put close support with the infantry, owned by the infantry. And there are systems coming online now that, that means, you know, clo the close battle for the battle group is out to 10 gears. The process is beginning to start, I think. Um, there's a system called Fletcher, which is starting to come, uh, been, been experimented with. It's, um, it's basically a, a laser-guided Hydra rocket, and it's not going to go anywhere near the Royal Artillery. It allows the battle group to do its own non-line-of-sight precision. The current variants are laser-guided, um, and this is going to be by an infantry or cavalry soldier, not a gunner. Uh, the RA used to perform this close support function, but the fact of the matter is it's too small. And it can't serve... It's a tank every killer. It's a, it's a precision strike system. It, it Tank, radar, machine gun post, you know, something that you can hit on the nose and degrade the enemy mm. rapidly. The artillery can't win the artillery duel anymore and still have enough barrels to do close support. You know, physics hasn't changed. Weight of fire calculations are the same. Just because you have less platforms doesn't mean you can reduce the weight of fire. You've either got to do artillery properly or don't. Find a different way of doing it. If equipment programs stay on track, then Ajax and Challenger 3 are going to be able to locate targets that will directly affect the battle group out at ranges that were the preserve of the Royal Artillery when, when we had foos and weapon locating radar. These are combat platforms that can do the job better if than, than the Royal Artillery team that's sent along to do that. Common sense says then if the battle group locates these targets, then it prosecutes them. And I think that non-line of sight is rapidly going to be just as important to the infantry as bayonets are. If you accept we can't manoeuvre like the good old days, then we need to change the shape of battle groups as well. We need to reduce to two murderous rifle companies with funky capabilities that give them an edge and I think we should increase support company to create another one so you end up with two multi-capability support companies or perhaps a target acquisition company and a strike company but it should belong to the yeah. infantry. I read recently uh, talking about this very subject where they talk about your snipers could be dual trained in uh, many UAVs with a you know like a, a strike capability or suicide mini drones mm -hmm. so Absolutely. I mean, you're seeing these in Ukraine. They're, they're, they're everywhere. Support companies, they should have recce. They should have fire support teams. They should have JTACs. They might also have GBAD. They should have counter drone. They should have 120 mortars. They should have this um, Fletcher guided system. Then there's the normal anti-tank and their, their traditional fare. Um, but if you look at what they're, what they're doing in uh, what we've given to Ukraine, we've given Brimstone but not on aircraft. So if you if you look at it holistically, you've now got the ability to strike armour with javelin. Overlapping that is this um, Fletcher system. Overlapping that is brimstone. 
So if these if these things are down at support company level, they can prosecute targets precisely and decisively. I think we missed a trick when we gave all our AS90s away. Instead of replacing them with a Swedish gun, maybe we should have replaced them with a Swedish CV90. You know, we could get these, get our FSTs, who no longer have an OPV apart from the Warrior one, which is rapidly falling off the perch. You know, these 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 are systems that we should have thought about. But as you've said, 120 motors. There are SP motors out there which can pack a real punch out to 12 k's. If we'd have bought Rack from Poland instead of Archer from Sweden, I think we'd have got more platforms than 14, and it can still spit shells out effectively. Then, of course, if you take things off the artillery, you're going to have people and units now with nothing to do, I think is a, a fair a fair assessment. If we give the infantry the task of close support, what do we do with the units and personnel who are currently trying to fill this role? I think it's simple. We follow what it says in Future Soldier and we switch from close to deep. I think it's time to emancipate UAS. Watchkeeper, I didn't write this, the Telegraph did, has been an abject failure. The link between MLRS and targeting was ruined in 2000 when we separated launches and Phoenix. Watchkeeper has become an ISR platform. I don't know what happened to the T and A. You know, iStar used to have more than three um, letters in it. Unless we're going to put battle-proven UAVs back as part of MLS regiments, then we're going to have to abdicate that responsibility. The RAF have got large UAVs. Leave them all there. Give the RAF all of the large UAVs. Smaller UAVs, different matter completely, as you've touched on already. They should be ubiquitous. We all know this. We knew this before the Ukraine war. The idea that we've got two whole Royal Artillery units providing parties that get tasked or to battle groups is laughable. Are you seriously telling me that 1,200 people will produce two or three or four task lines to the operation? This is crazy. 1,200 people. You know, just go back to your point about UAS and, and, and a point you made earlier about flexible thinking within the Royal Artillery. Is there not an argument that if you started dishing out all these mini UAVs to the sort of scale uh, that's been used in Ukraine, there'll be people whining on about airspace management, delineation and all the other, other bits and pieces. They'll just get wrapped around the axle of the safety side. Oh, of course they will. Yeah, this is, it's inevitable. It's inevitable. I would just say, well, look at, look at Ukraine. Yes, you're right. I'm, I don't know how many SU-25s or Heinz have been brought down by colliding with a DJI. I don't think it's many. They, they, they come down when they get shot down. But um, that's, you know, when it gets to warfare at scale, that is an irrelevance. The, the sort of line I take is, is MCON. When you train somebody to use a radio, you teach them about EW, ECM, ESM all that good stuff. Well, a drone's no different. So if you've if you've been trained to understand MCON and you can use a radio, then you can apply it to a small drone. Everybody that needs to see over the hill should have a drone. Fire support teams, MFCs, JTACs, tank commanders, battle group commander if he wants, you know, that why are we why do we strangle it and use 1200 people to produce a few task lines a day? It's crackers. Absolutely. And you crackers. used an analogy when I was talking to you before that many UAS should be treated as long-range binos, effectively, which yeah, I thought should. was a great, a great line. They, they should. If I'm looking. I look. Well, I was looking out my window. It's dark now, but um, there's a wood line out in my line of sight, about 300 meters. I can't see exactly what's behind it. So do you know what I do when I'm sat out the back of my garden? I get my little DJI out. I fly over there, go and look at the wildlife that's down the river, over the hill binos. That's exactly how they should be treated. If you know that you shouldn't transmit on your radio because radio silence is in force, then don't fly your drone. If if it's um, I can't remember what the MCON state is now. If if it's um, use everything to your heart's content and get your drone up. There was the BBC had the thing on with the Ukrainian mortar detachment picking their own targets up. You know, targets are to your front. The bad guys are over there. They were lift, lifting a drone up, flying it down gun target line spotting the Russians and lobbing shells at them. This is what these things are for. Cutting back that sensor to shoot a link to seconds, which is everything that seconds. he's been talking about for decades. Yeah. And if your enemy's doing it as well, you've just got to be faster and better than he is. So train with them. I think if I was an FST commander now, I wouldn't care what the rules were. If I was on a Tezex on the plane, 
I would have my drone in my pouch. I think, though, we need to make it back to the Royal Artillery. We've got all these people doing um, some things that I think are the preserve of the infantry now. We need to make the Royal Artillery a missile-only deep effects organisation. We should be, our focus, our sole role in life should be to destroy the enemy's OS, disrupt his command and control, break his log chain. The large Royal Artillery we joined, Colin, um, you know, we had a variety of tasks. You did one, I did another, there were other people did things. But the tiny contemporary Royal Artillery is being asked to do several badly. I've heard the term mass fires the other day. I do not know how you can mass fires from two light gun batteries. The Royal Artillery should do one job well. I mean, I'm, I am a, obviously an MLRS advocate, um, and it's been a rocky road for it. You know, we abandoned Bomblet. I think that was a mistake. We reached the point where only the reserves had regimental responsibility to provide deep fires, and the regular batteries got split up like ginger step kids. They had no ammo lift, so when they parceled them off to AS90 regiments, they gave them no organic ammo lift. That's crackers. And again, it's down to the Afghan use, where it was looked at as a very close support tool. I always try to get people to reflect on um, what it can do. A troop of three launchers. So we got to the point where we, we had small amounts of launchers. Three launchers can hit 36 separate targets in 50 seconds. That's a fire plan. Mm. That's not a fire mission, that's a fire plan. You target 36 things, it can get them all in less than a minute. And I use the analogy because we got to the point where we only had 35 guided capable MLS launchers. So if we fought somebody that was equipped like us, they could have got rid of our entire Divati threat in 50 seconds. A launcher can fire 12 individually targeted missiles. That's a fire plan. But back to training, they've started to do... MLRS a bit more now but I don't hear fire plans I only hear fire missions and I don't hear fire plans to one launcher it can target 12 things in 50 seconds but the tide's changing I mean there's one regular regiment back 2-6 um, regiment and 3rd RHA returning to missiles they might not all know that but they had swing fire before 1990 so they're going back to what they should do I've heard the quote Look at your cap badge, Neil. It's a gun, not a rocket launcher. It's irrelevant. The gun on our cap badge is a muzzle-loading antique. Things change. The gun on the Royal Tank Regiment's cap badge, or the tank rather, is one of those lozenge-shaped World War One things that crawled along next to the infantry. Challenger 3 can see 10 kilometres. Yeah. So I think hanging on to a small volume of guns to, provide, to try to provide close support, yet also aspiring to fire precision out to 50 k's with them, means that when the, your gun gets located, supporting the infantry, and then destroyed, you can't fire your, ex, your Excalibur around. So don't try and be all things to all men. Ditching guns and going all in with MLS and HIMARS is where we should aspire to be. But we would have to get in line behind Poland. Poland has just bought 426 HIMARS. But it's enough to stop the Russians. Right. They, they've they got a threat on their border, let's be frank, but you know, that, that the production line is going to be churning high Mars out for Poland. So let's continue with three regiments of M270, and then we should be making 1st, 4th, and 19 high Mars. That gives you 108 launchers. That is enough to start unbalancing an enemy at range. I mean, you could keep guns, but you would have to ditch close support. And guns do have a bigger detachment. Even Archer, three man the same as MLRS, but manpower can't be ignored. You cut down your manpower that's required when you've got launchers. And then there are other things. GBAD. I mean, our GBAD is woefully small. Air defense. Yes, sorry, ground-based air defense. Woefully small. But then you've mentioned the uh, first-person view drones that are becoming a threat. You know, give them to the snipers was your call. When, you, when your enemy snipers are doing it, you've got to shoot them down. Lancet is a threat that the Russians seem to be using. You know, we could end up with all of these funky armoured platforms and lose them all because we've got no GBAD. GBAD needs to grow, but it needs to grow in coverage, not just people. I think we need to look how carefully Russia's hunting for Ukrainian HIMARS and M270, and we should formalise protection. So, when we were lads, Abbott regiments had air defence batteries with them. 
I don't know if you remember that. There used mm-hmm. to be a blowpipe battery with every Abbott regiment. Yeah. I think this link should return around our high volume platforms. I think another thing, and I don't know if you'll agree with this, but one of the things you do when you see the sort of UAS footage from Ukraine, and even now, the basics of poor track discipline, mm. poor camouflage and concealment, I think those skills still need to be focused on. They but absolutely do. Something you see... I see it insofar as I don't see them doing anything beyond really low-level skills. Either. I can't speak for the infantry. I don't get that close to them when they're on exercise. But the artillery... The, the guns don't often go on um, collective training exercises. It's actually just the fire support teams that do. The guns have started to go on them. MLRS is also interesting because it doesn't go on collective training. It, it's viewed as a, you know, they do it in the regiment. There, there's a big program to recapitalise everything, bring new launches in. But unless you're shown how bad your track discipline is, you can't rectify it. Unless you fly drones over them, they'll never understand it. We should be flying drones against platforms all the time. There are moves to start doing this in training. The, you know, my company, we we we've started flying drones, and so have some of our um, the other people who do the same thing as us. But it, yeah, track discipline, camouflage. I sort of watched a gun battery live firing last year, and they 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 were unboxing their ammo outside the net. Maybe there's a safety reason nowadays for it, but you shouldn't be able to tell what's under a net. You can see nets. We've always known that you can see nets. Part of the game is to deny your enemy the knowledge of what is under it. And when there's a big gaping contained shadow at the front with a barrel sticking out, and then a pile of ammunition boxes right on the edge getting getting broken open, big, you know, the, the wood is gleaming. It's clean and, and you can be seen from space. So, yeah, these are the low-level skills that aren't getting trained. If you watch the Ukraine with MLRS, they, they started using fired pods and very realistic decoys to outwit Russian targeting. Don't know if they've lost any any real launches at the moment. They might have, but you don't. I haven't seen any. But I have seen a Lancet striking what they thought was a, a high Mars, and it was a it was a decoy. But this has to be done deliberately, and it has to be convincing, and it can't be just a job for the Q for the BQMS. It's got to be done properly. And then the other little sort of uh, community that I think has been ignored and and marginalised is 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 your old lot, the um, Special OP troops and STA artillery. You know, when you and I joined, your OP troops were basically foos for M107s, you know, long range, finding targets in the second echelon at range. And then with the radars, we had Cymbeline, which became Cobra, which became Mamba, and we don't have very many. And I think if each soldier aspires to strike out to 499 Ks, then the destruction of enemy OS is the role that both of those systems should return to. You know, we don't need a kind of plastic special forces and we don't need people who can locate things on live artillery ranges we need terminal guidance for killer bros on high value targets and i think both of those things should stay and should be um if not expanded focused and the reserves they come in for stick and there's always debate about what they should do obviously you can probably tell i'm a bit of a fan because i've done two tours with them but i think People should look back in history. I've heard lots of arguments recently, or just make them truck drivers, or just make them infantry. But in our history, where we've had small regular forces, so in the Napoleonic Wars in Spain, First World War, Second World War, the regular army is just a speed bump. The regular army is destroyed in the opening engagements until the nation can start swinging into action and getting its um, industrial warfare rolling. Kitchener's army in World War I, that was PALS battalions and, and um, regiments like the Tyneside Scottish that were raised by private subscription. World War Two, the Sherwood Yeomanry, probably the most successful armoured regiment in the British Army, all um, reserves. Yeah. And so I think it's important, if not critical, that the reserve Royal Artillery mirrors the regular in thought, word and deed, if not necessarily kit holdings. I appreciate that kit, expensive kit is finite, but they should have the same roles. They should exercise doing the same roles and if you left fifth regiment intact and gave them a proper focus and if you stand fast 12 and 16 and made them uh, kept the uh, medium level air defense we've still got on our orbit first third fourth 19 26 32 47 101 103 104 105 and the hac and to me that now should be 11 deep strike units each of a missile battery a deception battery and a close air defense battery not a gun in sight 
And I think if we did that kind of radical change, it would meet the spirit of Future Soldier. That's interesting because you mentioned deception earlier on and saying it shouldn't fall to the BQMS. But I didn't realise that you were getting at actually having a, a battery dedicated to deception. That's interesting. So would that, would that be things like uh, blow up dummy decoys? Yeah, there's, there's a, under I think there's a che- Yeah, there's a Czech company that's making some really effective ones. There's an Australian company. I can't remember the Czech company's name. The Australian company Guard Tech. They started making effect really realistic live fire targets and that's um you know that's the kind of thing that we should be using it should be deliberate when we in the cold war in germany we used to um, put out dummy m107 positions about 500 meters in front of the the real gun battery you know the idea being that when the hind came to his six figure grid he found what he thought was a gun battery but it wasn't you know that it's got to be done deliberately can't be played at earlier on in the podcast mate we're talking about command post exercises and how they used to get the whole regiment out dispersed around the camps they used to run CPXs and you're thinking that's sadly lacking can you just cover a little bit on that just so and take it into a bit more depth yes absolutely so um, there, people will um, always find it difficult to get equipment out of um, Donington you know whole fleet management requires you to get your launchers out or your guns out or your CPs or your Bowman Land Rovers this is always difficult but the CPX, in my experience in Germany, was the key tool to make people competent at procedures, make you slick. You know, we were very good when we were, you know, I would say this, wouldn't I? But we were very good when we were younger because we did it regularly, because it was a simple thing to do. Now, we had Klansman radios, didn't take as much effort as Bowman. I appreciate that. But you would line up on the square, as you remember, and the commanding officer would get out of his tack wagon he would go to the locating command post he would initiate a fire mission or a fire plan or a target location hostile battery report and then it would just cascade down the regiment the whole thing would cascade down the regiment and then he'd walk alongside and then get down to the gun battery that was selected and the gun all six guns would be would be swinging into action and engaging that thing it was repetitive but it engendered competency so people got good at what they had to do. They knew that when a fire plan came down, the, the bombardier could take the warning order and then the adjutant had to be dragged in. Fire discipline was really good. It was slick. And I accept it's difficult. If we're talking about deep strike, currently with what they've got, you've got a UAV regiment in one barracks. They're going to find targets, but they've got to pass them to somebody. You've got a new construct for the Divati Ops where um, two, six and third regiments have to basically staff the um, the strike cells at Div. And then you've got the missile batteries. And it's hard to get these people together, especially when your target information is coming from 50 miles away now, not from 5Ks in front of you. And there are systems that need to be emulated and context does matter. But it's quite simple to do these now. Now, the business I'm in, simulation, we do facilitate some of these things, and it's actually easier than you would think. We're, we're talking now um, 300 miles online. It's reasonably clear. It is at my end. I don't know what you sound like. So we use, we use at work, we use um, a gaming system, and it's called Mumble. It's an XMPP protocol. But we set up nets, so when we're doing training in the in the facility and a battery tack group comes in, they don't have to bring their radios. They don't have to bring any of their Bowman kit. They would do some of this by data, I accept that. But what we do is we can create multiple nets, and they can do their procedures, they can work with people, they can pass things backwards and forwards. And just because it's been done by voice, not by data, doesn't mean that the, that the system isn't get exor- doesn't get exercised or it is getting exercised. We used to drag our um, backsides around Germany every six weeks or so. All the regimental CPs would go on Sheldrake, spears and Sheldrake, swords, and we'd do fire plans, fire missions, arty tactical tasks. You can do that now between barracks. We can enable it. They could probably do it themselves. I accept that the, you need the right people in place to do these things. But um, we had some interesting um, things during COVID. So, I mean, first of all, I used to do my own stuff when I was um, with 204 Battery up in Kingston Park. We did some more work with 101 during COVID, and they did an exercise where they had the launcher group on exercise in Kakubi Range up in um, Dumfries and Galloway. 
They sent their regimental headquarters to us in, in uh, Amesbury. We asked 4-7 Regiment, the UAV, the Watchkeeper Regiment, if they could loan us a couple of um, mission controllers. They did. So we gave them um, our simulated UAV feeds. And then we sent some of the tablets for downlinks with a 101 Regiment LO who went to Grafenvor to do an exercise with 41st FAB in Grafenvor. And what you had... So what is, so what is FAB? FAB, Field Artillery Brigade, I'm going to say. So the Americans have got these... Um, they've grouped their... A bit like we've started to do now, they've grouped their artillery into um, just artillery um, brigades. So this LO went with 41st FAB in Grafenvor. He had voice and data comms using our little system all the way back to the headquarters in Solstice Park and all the way up to the launcher group in um, in Kakubri. We sent some simulated stuff up there. And the exercise that they were doing was the Germany exercise. So the Americans were targeting stuff on the Czech-German border. We were providing live UAV feed of these simulated targets that we were putting down. It was getting processed in the headquarters and then fire missions fired out up to Kakubri where they were firing them on, on um, little training laptops. And then the UAV in Solstice Park, but putting its downlink in Germany, was seeing the um, the effects on the ground and getting BDA. And that was just mumble nets and JChat nets and text messages that we... And this is all relatively together. inexpensive equipment. Relatively ex- inexpensive. And, and of course, I want people to give me bags of cash to do it, but having a chat, I mean, I don't know what you do with about putting the... Um, putting links on and um, and contact details afterwards. Always happy to have a chat with somebody because you can't accidentally buy anything. I don't have a card reader. It's not possible. But I can give people advice on how to do simple exercises that are split all over the place. And the thing is, if we see it with the little exercises we do run in our, in our place, when we get young people who you would in the past have called the second 11, doing the fire missions, doing the fire plans, doing the regrouping orders they start to understand it and they certainly understand it if you wrap a bit of sim around it but that's not essential it's the cpx which is the catalyst for um slick drills and competent procedures what i'll do neil is i'll put uh your i'll get your your contact details off off you and i'll put them in the show notes of the podcast if people want to get in touch Mm -hmm. no problem you'll be glad to know mate i've got us on to our final question so i've been uh sort of draining you of information over the last hour or so. So the UK has traditionally fielded a small army in comparison to the continent and tended to project its power through the navy. With the army shrinking to Napoleonic era size, a lack of equipment, chronic underinvestment in infrastructure and difficulties in recruiting, something affecting all three services to be fair. The questions are, should we just face reality and amalgamate all three services into a defence force? Should this defence force be structured US Marine Corps style, retaining some sort of limited expeditionary capability? And finally, is it time to upset retired colonels in the shires and get rid of the regimental system structure? Okay, well, a roundabout the answer. Yeah, mate, I know. So. No, it's, it's, um, it's good and uh, there's, some, there's some nice links there. I think the roundabout answer, you don't need to worry. So I think uh, Ukraine has destroyed Russian combat power for a generation, uh, it, without a doubt. It doesn't matter, it, of course it matters to Ukraine, but from our perspective, it doesn't matter whether this drags on for years or what. The, the Russian combat power on continental Europe is done for a generation. Coupled with that, Poland is between us and Russia. Poland is rearming. It was at MSPO, which is a trade show in, in um, southern Poland, two, three weeks ago, Poland is rearming at a phenomenal rate. I mean, I mentioned 426 HIMARS. I don't know if you know, but Hyundai make tanks. So the Poles have just bought, I think, 400 K2 Panthers, which is a sort of a a, a South Korean leopard lookalike. They've got Abrams M1A2s. They've got leopards. They've got their own PT-91s. They have just opened a second production line for crab howitzers. That that country is between us and Russia. I don't think we need to worry about Russia. And the clever thing then would be to leave the army to rot, put all of your money into the 
Royal Navy and the Royal Air Force because the Army has got the luxury of time, I think, if you're talking about a big peer threat. And I don't think we're going to face the Chinese anytime soon. If By the time you got to the Pacific, you know, the, the main stuff, the sinking of carriers and dropping of nuclear bombs would have happened. So I think we have got the luxury of time. That's the first thing. I think we also need to realise that there's no votes in defence. It's only people like us that get animated about it. Joe Public really doesn't care. Um, they're more bothered about <laughs> yeah, NHS that's too. True. And it's, there's no votes in defence. NHS. Yeah. Schools. NHS, HS2, wind farms, whatever. It's not defence. Defence is not is not going to get anybody except us up in a sweat. And then a blind man can see that we can't attract enough recruits. Um, in some ways, some of these discussions might be academic. I mean, we, we, are, we are going to drop in size. I think that's inevitable. Uh, I know that they've said they're going to do that. Um, whether it gets to US Marine Corps size, maybe. But I think there's, a, there's a, another way to skin that cat. I don't think we're quite at defence force stage yet. But um, it could it could happen, it could happen. I went to a seminar at Sandhurst when I was in RSM, and this old duffer harumphed. We don't want these kinds of people to to the to the um, presenter who was sort of like saying where we're going to get our recruits from, and he said, "I'm sorry, but this is your recruiting pool, and our recruiting pool don't want to join. It's a fact of life." Yeah. Um, it's the same in America. It is. It's the, it's the same throughout the, the, the Western world, except maybe Poland. Mm. Um, I can see natural evolutions, though. You know, why have we got Army Infantry, Royal Marines, and RAF Regiment? And I know that there are well-trodden answers to those questions. It's rhetorical. But at some point, they're all similar kinds of people with a rifle. So why have we got three different kinds spread between three services, two of which don't really do the land stuff and haven't we always been expeditionary but I think that's interesting because I think the army's forgotten that it's expeditionary I genuinely think it's forgotten think it thinks it lives in Wiltshire and that's where it'll stay <laughs> um, I mean because defence has got rid of landing ships we can't move large amount we'd have to get row rows and hire civvy shipping to, to move anything fast um, why are all three services using helicopters? I, I know they do different roles, yeah, but it's a classic. That's why a have classic, we... <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why is the army doing large UAVs? Why don't we just lease olive drab pickup trucks? I mentioned um, Hyundai at MSPO. Kia also had a huge trade stand, and they was they were pitching these sort of hybrid, like like smaller than a Humvee, bigger than a pickup truck with some degree of protection, with weapon mounts, with seats. You know, there was no question whether you could move somebody in the back of one of them, like you kind of a Bowman Land Rover. You just have to look at the effectiveness of technicals in third world countries. Yeah. Like 50 cal on the back even. 50 cal on the back. Of course, no. Western Army's a lot of problem over yeah. the year. Low tech kills. And, and, yeah. and, and low tech moves fast as well. You know, it's not a lumbering great uh, mastiff. You know, you're on a road, bomb cheap down to maintain, a road. Cheap to maintain, cheap fix. to maintain. Get civvy companies to do that. You know, I remember uh, when we were youngsters that the Bundeswehr used to have um, VW sort of transporter open back things, and they were all serviced at the local VW garage. You don't need to employ fitters or mm. ha have large MTs. Just get these things, because we're paying an enormous amount of money to thrifty and people like that. I don't know if you've been down on the plane in the last couple of years when there's a Wessex storm on. There's more higher cars and higher trucks than there are green army stuff. It's crazy. And then I think, though, that the, the drop in recruiting is going to force our hands and it's going to shrink. And, and, and we're either going to have to sh shrink our structures and get to the US Marine Corps and then the defence force, or we're going to have to bring in national service. And that is never going to fly. That, that there is, If you think there's no votes in defence, you watch the votes if somebody proposes national service. They'll all be the other way. <laughs> um, and I've got a radical one, and I think in keeping with the title of your podcast, how about an unconventional solution? The government can't stop boats landing in Kent with young men on them, and I'm not going to get political about this, but why don't we bust them all to Catrick and offer them passports in exchange for service? 
And if they understood that on the other side of the channel, that their options aren't a five-star hotel in a country club, but instead Catrick Garrison, six years in the army, then a passport, I reckon it probably will make the numbers drop a bit. But by the same token, you might get some people who, you know, we've 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 got plenty of Commonwealth soldiers in the army. It's not necessarily um, palatable to some people, and it's definitely an unconventional answer, but it would deal with the drop in recruiting. The Americans do it, don't they? Uh, obviously, there's uh, security implications there. Yeah. French Foreign Legion do it. Yeah, yeah. absolutely right. Uh, you'd have to be very careful about who you let through the door. But Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> As you say, beggars can't be choosers, mate. Beggars cannot be choosers. And beggars is an interesting word because um, you mentioned infrastructure, and um, I think that's interesting. If you continue to pay your young law soldiers low wages, then you're going to have to provide a roof and three square meals. And we've got this perfect storm coming now where some of the accommodation, even if the RAF are complaining about their, their barrack blocks, it's got really bad. If you're not going to pay enough, then pay as you dine isn't going to be an option. So you are going to be back to barracks and cookhouses if you're hiring beggars with no shoes like the Napoleonic era. That's where we're getting to. This is why people don't join. They see better paid jobs in Civvy Street. If you want to attract people, you're either going to have to lift the pay, which means there isn't money to fix the buildings, or you keep the pay where it is, which means that your people can't afford to go into a um, a nice Sodexo pays your dine facility and and pay um, street prices. They're going to need cookhouses again. So you know it's a, it's it's not a simple circle to square or square to circle. And I'm not bothered about upsetting retired officers either. I mean, I can imagine what some people who heard me sort of option for immigrants would think. But traditions are always getting made in, anew. The figures. Don't lie. If you Google quarterly service personnel statistics and go onto the gov.uk site, you can see the direction of travel of numbers. If you have no people, you can't have an army. And I've wondered if we could have a different model. And I think while you know my, there's a bit of tongue in cheek about the um, guys landing in Kent, but I think there is a there is a different way, and that's to privatise elements of it. The regimental structure is a problem and an opportunity and it's an opportunity because it does provide precedence albeit a couple of hundred years ago so we used to have private artillery trains the Tyneside Scottish my reserve unit they were raised by private subscription in the middle of the world war I'd like to see proof that county town loyalty matters anymore that would be the first thing and I don't think it does you'll remember that there's Lawson's company the Green Howards so maybe it's yeah. time to start over with Babcock's rifles. <laughs> the commercial world, well, you, you laugh, but there are PMCs everywhere. I'm not suggesting we get like Wagner. That's probably at the wrong end of the scale. But remember all of the PMCs that were in um, Iraq? Yes, it would need legislating. Yes, there would have to be um, discussions about who controls what and who deploys who, how it's done. The East India Company existed for quite a long time till the mutiny. And the commercial world might fare better than the military trying to use a contractor to do it. And I'll tell you, for for nothing, the commercial world will pay better and it'll probably house better. We had an interesting discussion with uh, a New Zealand PMC uh, who worked for a subsidiary of Blackwater. And we had a very similar conversation about what you've just discussed there, about, about where PMCs are going. And, you know, there was more PMCs working in Iraq than there were regular army soldiers, so it's not as if it doesn't happen. And you can raise them in time of war. Um, you don't have to have them a standing force ready to go, and you can get rid of them just as quick. And there's no worry about pensions, all those capitation costs that make a soldier so expensive. Absolutely right. And they'll bring their own kit and equipment. Everyone's a winner. OK, mate. So we'll finish off with Desert Island Discs. Wrong. I've robbed that. That's where I got me the uh, <laughs> me idea from. What I meant to say was, we'll finish off with Desert Island Dits, which is the guest book, film, and luxury item choice. So, mate, what have you picked? Well, from the book, I'm um, currently reading Mick Heron's latest Slow Horses book. I don't know if you've uh, seen Gary Oldman on on um, Apple TV, Slow Horses, and that's called The Secret Hours. 
But that would come to an end, and I kind of assume that this is uh, based around being shipwrecked or dumped or abandoned or extradited. So if I'm going to have to read something over and over again, and I do like a laugh, it would be Roger's Profanosaurus. <laughs> oh, my classic. <laughs> From Vez. It's a, it is a classic. <laughs> we have a... I think we have some American... Right back in the day. It absolutely does. We had some... We have, we, we're an American corporation, and uh, we do trade shows with some of them, and uh, a couple of years ago... We sent copies of it to three or four of them because they questioned in our sense of humour all the way through this trade show. So little parcels arrived at work, Rogers Profanosaurus, and I know three of the four appreciated it and one didn't. (laughs) Well, funny you should say that, mate. When I worked in defence, I would go out to uh, Afghanistan and we employed a number of American UAV pilots. And during the... uh, Days when you couldn't fly because the weather was so bad. We used to sit down and we'd put on the oh god, I just forgot the bloody name of it. Bus bus stop wankers program. <laughs> in between us, in between us, that's it. And when we first put them on, the the faces were a, a real. Pay- I got more fun watching their faces because first they couldn't <laughs> believe what they were hearing, and second they couldn't believe it got commissioned as a, as a TV program. <laughs> so yeah, Br- Br- something Br- short Br- Br- well. best. <laughs> exactly, mate. Film choice. So, right, f- film choice. I think that's easy. Kelly's Heroes. If um, if my wife's away and uh, I've got a bottle of wine and I'm going to put something on, it's normally that. Who would you be to be a character in, in Kelly's Heroes? I think I'd be the um, Mulligan, the log guy, getting the bars of gold to call <laughs> mortars. <laughs> <laughs> Keep you know, stick I'd, to what you know. I have to. S- <laughs> exactly, mate. Exactly, and your looks right. Um, I've never had this before, mate, and I can think of nothing worse. Tell me what your luxury item is. Oh, right. Well, I'm, again, assuming I've been shipwrecked, um, it would have to be a washed ashore container full of scampy fries. The food of the gods. Yeah, <laughs> mate. I can, you can make me a packet of them. <laughs> Delicious. Well, on that bombshell, mate, I'll quickly, I'll quickly move on to my book choice. Talked a lot about Ukraine over the last period. Of the podcast, and uh, so I'm picking Berlin, The Downfall, 1945 by Anthony Beaver, because the destruction in Ukraine reminded me of this book. And uh, post-Cold War, Beaver was given unrestricted access to the archives in Moscow, uh, unthinkable now. And he was one of the first to uncover the truth of mass rapes from the Soviet army and as in Berlin, and as Beaver remarks, the widespread raping of women taken forcibly from the Soviet Union completely undermines any attempts at justifying Red Army behaviour on the grounds of revenge for German brutality in the Soviet Union. And the scale of the battle, we're talking about mass matters earlier on, Neil, still put in place an enormous force for the final assault in Berlin, including 2.5 million troops, 7,500 aircraft, 6,250 tanks, and this is the killer for gunners, 41,600 guns. <laughs> Not unbelievable. 12 light guns then. Not 12 light guns, and these were like, because they didn't have to worry about a lot about counter-battery, a lot of these gun positions were straight-line gun positions, which is, mm-hmm. back in our day, was a strict no-no. And interestingly, the Soviets were vengeful, mass rapes, wrecked de- death and destruction on a huge scale, and you just wonder how much of this is ingrained in the Russian character, as we see it again played out in uh, Ukraine. So the Butcher's Bill was 78,000 Russian troops killed and more than a quarter of a million wounded. You think about how the Russian soldiers getting wounded in Ukraine are going to be trapped because post-war they used to round up the wounded and limbless former Red Army soldiers and get them out of the way of Moscow because they cluttered up the Soviet streets and made them look at place look untidy. Yeah. And uh, for the one and a half million former Soviet POWs that were sent to that were liberated, they were then sent to Siberia because obviously. They might be contaminated by the Germans and they hadn't fought hard enough. Figures for German losses were 90 to 100,000 killed, 220,000 wounded and nearly half a million taken as prisoners of war. A lot of them were sent to Russia and never got back to the 1950s. And farmers and construction workers are still turning up bodies today. So yeah, uh, war at its worst. That's it for another episode. Thanks for coming on the podcast and to you the listener for your continued support and suggestions. Please keep them coming. And our email and social media links are at the bottom of the show notes. And check out Neil on LinkedIn, where he is a, always offers a blunt and honest opinion <laughs> about his thoughts. No pussyfooting around. 
Uh, and you see a lot of the stuff we discussed in the podcast there as well. And I'll also put in, uh, I'll get his email or whatever off and put it in at the end of the show notes if you want to get in touch with about any sort of training. You can find us in all the usual suspects, including Instagram, Facebook, YouTube and Twitter. Give us a review. It brings more people in. Need some more five-star reviews. And thanks again to Nick Beal for his continued support and sponsorship to the series and offering technical support for his company ISAR. And we'll see you next time on The Unconventional Soldier. 